hey, welcome to uh, smocking or pleat work embroidery. Um, this class is going to have a short lecture. Um, the lecture is more um, a um, kind of how to get started, um, some some images that you can look at, and some words that you can use when um, when researching. Um, and then I'm going to go into a demo and show you how to actually do the process. So that's kind of what's going to happen tonight. So welcome all y'all. We're going to have a little bit of fun. Um, feel free if you have a question to go ahead, just unmute yourself and and holler out. Or I know, um, Beth, you were having trouble with your audio. So I'll try to keep an eye on the on the chat and I'll make sure if nothing else to go back. And, and look at the chat and answer any questions that anyone's put in the chat um, at the end of the lecture. Because I can always go back to slides. I can um, keep an eye on the chat for you and bring oh. it to your attention. Thank you, James. This is super handy there. I feel like I, feel like I have like a Vanna White named James. <laughs> um, <laughs> awesome. So. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and get my my um, my PowerPoint up, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody. Here we go. Um, all right. So share screen, and I'm gonna click, click PowerPoint, and I'm gonna share it. Ta-da! Okay. Let's get you up. I'm gonna close out so I'm stop. Don't have to watch myself. And then I'm gonna hit this button. There we go. All right. So here we go. We're off on the races. So again, this is smocking, also called pleat work and embroidery. And I am Baroness Lottie Winterborn. So welcome to the class. All right. So this in this lecture, we're going to be covering some art where you see pleat work and embroidery happening. We're going to look at a couple extant examples and we're going to see a couple things that folks have recreated themselves. So getting started, um, one of the, er the earliest examples that I personally have visually found is in the Luttrell Psalter. It is an English manuscript. Um, it, is, it is a 14th century manuscript. And I highly recommend, um, if you haven't, it's, it's, there's a digital copy online. If you haven't looked through it, um, and you're not, even if you're not interested in manuscripts, it is something fabulous to look through. There are just all the details and you can tell there, I think there's about four or five different artists who have contributed to that manuscript. And it's really neat to see the different, um, their different styles. So moving, so looking into the Luttrell Psalter in one section, um, one of, one of the, uh, um, illuminators has given us some really, really great looks into working day life. Um, and here we see not just one or two, but many different examples of, of, of women wearing aprons while they're both outside working and inside working. We see a lady, um, the lady over here on your top right, she's actually feeding chickens as she has her, um, you can see her, 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 her spindle work there as she, you know, she goes about and spins also. Um, the lady in the middle is carrying water. The lady in the top right, I think I started, I said left, so. We're, we're starting on the left, we're going as you read. So middle, top right, um, that those, the folks in that picture are actually harvesting, I believe it's wheat. And then if we go down to the bottom left, there's a woman spinning. And um, the bottom right, I believe she's, she's like hoeing a garden is what's happening in that one. I don't remember that one exactly. But as you see, they all are wearing aprons. And all of these aprons are indicating that they have a type of pleat work embroidery. And we mostly can tell that because of this center lady here, if we look at her, at the top of her skirt, and this far right lady up here, it, it represents um, one of the stitches that, excuse me, is used, um, it's called a honeycomb stitch. And it creates that, that X-like pattern or that, 
that that pricked pattern. Um, so so that's um, how that's that's kind of my analysis of this and 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 how I've looked at this before. Um, and this was actually my very first ANS entry I did was a smocked apron, and um, I was inspired by the, all these wonderful images from the Luttrell Psalter. So moving on, we're going to look at portraiture and art, and this is. I think um, I judged that entry. You know, I think you did too. It was. Is so that King of ANS in Cincinnati? With, at the 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 Tudor the Tudor uh, Hotel area. Yeah. Place? Yes, that was me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I totally forgot you would judge that. <laughs> Found my documentation the other day. I'm like, wow, I've come a long way. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yay. Well, that's fantastic. Yes. Sorry, didn't mean to totally sidetrack. No, that's totally okay. That's what this is about. <laughs> um, so moving on, we're going to go later in um, a, um, SCA period because it kind of really disappears for a while um, in art. I believe they're still using it, it's, but it's because um, because uh, art is, you know, it's it's financed by the the, the rich. So therefore, um, we're seeing portraiture in in illuminations of of richer people. Although we still do have some illuminations of everyday life, we're just not seeing the detail that we find in the Luttrell Psalter. So um, we we find it we find it in um, primarily in Germany and Italy, but we also find not as much, but some in England. Um, so I mostly have um, German and Italian. Excuse me. Um, art that we're going to look at, and this is just a glance because this is um, all over in portraiture, in um, um, prints. Um, they're um, uh, Durer and Urs Graf do a lot of of prints and um, or wood 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 block printing. So you see a lot in in those also. But I've got a couple examples here, and I'm gonna go get my notes out, and I'm gonna go through them just so um, you all are looking are inspired by something. Um, you can go find it. Um, so again, starting on the top left, and we're gonna go through like we're reading. So um, starting on the top left, we have a, a girl and she has got an apron on. And this is kind of a hard picture to see it, but you can see the top of her apron, like the women in the Luttrell Psalter, has that smocking to it. Um, and we can mostly tell by the detail of how the the skirt the the skirt is laying we can't really see the upper detail mostly because of the lighting of how this um this this print has been made but this one is from the fountain of youth by Cranach. and this girl she's like really small on the the left hand side this is a very blown up picture of that um next we're going to look at this self portrait of albrecht durer who was a um mo known for um portraiture but also of or portraiture and painting but more for his his woodcuts um he's got some i i love his woodcuts he's got fantastic woodcuts um but if you if you look at his top it's not really embroidered but the pleat work is there. Um, it's it's really um, uh, tightly ruched in here on the bottom to hold it where it is. And then those pleats, they've got they've they've got probably several strings running in through them just to hold them in place. But if you remember linen, it, it does crease really well. Um, and then it's held there at the top. It is secured by that nice gold lacing up there. So there's, you know, another example of kind of how, how the pleat work is used because it's, it's used for more than just embroidering on, as we'll see. So moving on, um, let's see, that one is, this is Magdalena of Saxony by Cranach. And you can see also her, um, her, um, her, her chemise, uh, I forget the German word for this, but her, her undershirt here is, um, 
is, is very pleated. You see this a lot in um, upper class women having vast amounts of, of this, this small pleat work that's all drawn together and then held in her golden nick band. So it's all held up in there. Um, so, and this is a separate band that's been sewn on top of it. So going down to the bottom, um, we have a, a portrait of Dorothea by Hans Holden. Um, and uh, Genevieve von Lübeck here of the, the Mid-Realm has done a, re a beautiful recreation of this dress. Um, uh, I've got a link to her blog in um, my further research page at the end, and you can go see that. But um, you can't see it very clearly on here, but if you go look at Genevieve's, she's got some beautiful smock work. But this one is a bit, is really interesting how you have the gold band at the top holding the, those pleats together, but then you have the pleats themselves having this, this, this different, um, um, it's not really, it's not cut work, but it's almost, it's an addition of, of um, a, a, a string to, um, to, to add to that instead of just embroidering on top of the pleats. Um, so next is one of my very favorite drawings. It's by Hans Holbein. It is um, a woman from Basel walking to the left. And again, you, you see this, um, this is actually of a, um, this, this lady is actually a, middle class woman, she would have been of the merchant class or the burger class. So she wouldn't have been lower class, but you, she still has that, um, that pleat work embroidery or that pleat work showing um, in her undershirt to show her, um, her, her bit of wealth. And, um, and it comes all up here in, in the neck. And this, um, I've interpreted this two ways. One is that it is uh, the pleat work is embroidered, and the second way is it's a band. It kind of depends on what day I'm looking at it. And you can see this is actually made, so she has a, a little bit of a ruff at the, the top. Not quite as, as dominant as the English rust, but just a very soft ruffle. Um, moving on to the next one, we have, this is a um, portrait of a young man. This is an Italian, um, uh, this is an Italian portrait by Ambrose Holbein. Um, I have not found his connection to Hans Holbein, but there's got to be a connection somewhere, right? So as you see, um, his, his wider neckline here um, has been, um, and, and very, um, you can really see the pleat work embroidered X's on this. And again, just a little bit of a ruffle at the top. And, uh, oh, I forgot to write this one down. So this, so I apologize. This is going to be a, um, a, uh, a, a work from Saxony. So if you look at the Cranach photo, or excuse me, the Cranach, um, if you follow Cranach's work, he was painting in Saxony. He was, which is a very high, high German, um, little different than um, what they were doing in St. Nuremberg or Basel. Um, but just these ladies with, again, their, their, their pleat work on their undershirts coming up into a ruffle, um, you can see on both the women, and you can see this pleat work sleeve on this, this gentleman here, and underneath those ruffles, you can't see it in the carving, but that would have all been, been, been pulled together in pleat work and probably embroidered on just just to kind of stabilize it there. All right, so let's take a drink. So moving on, we're gonna take a look at some extant ex surviving extant examples. So the first one we're gonna look at, this is um, the Mary of Habsburg gown. This um, is, exists in the Hungarian National Museum. And I just have this this bit of the dress. So this is this this gold piece here. This is so think Burgundian, where they have the V coming down. So this gold is is the V of the dress, and then this is her underdress poking poking out um, there over her bust area. Um, so I apologize for the quality of this photo, but it was hard to find a close up of this. 
Um, but you, but all of these are teeny tiny. This was a very, very fine linen they used. Of course, it was royal, so um, uh, so very high class. So very, you know, linen of the finest quality. And this embroidery would have been gold work um, or silver work. It's it. it I, I don't remember which one they say it is, but it's either a tarnished silver or gold. I, I want to say it's gold, but you can see it's aged a bit differently than the gold of the of the dress. So it might have been a silver. Um, but again, this is the this embroidery is all on those pleats. It's not on a separate piece and added on. These are all on the pleats. So that's something. That's a really good extant example. If you want to go in to pleat work embroidery, you can look up some better photos and see um, see 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 that detail really well. Um, so next, this is uh, going back to Italy. This is an Italian camicia. So this one I think is interesting because it's done a little. You can tell it's done a little differently here on the cuff. So it actually looks as if they embroidered. Did, did this embroidery on on the the underdress first, and then they pleat worked it. So the embroidery is not um, structural or holding those pleats in, but um, but there it's you know it's the the pleats have been smooshed a little bit, so it, it gives a bit of a different texture to it instead of having a nice a nice flow and and showing how that's been ruched in. Um, to to uh, probably fit. Oh, I went to the wrong. Um, there's probably some sort of band that it actually fit under. Um, but there's so there's a, there's an it, there's an example of an Italian one that you can look at. And then next, we're, this is an English one, and this one's a little different. Oh, I'm sorry. That the Italian camicia is um, located in the Mu Museo del Tessuto in Prato, Italy, and this is a, it was a mid 16th century. Um, so moving on, uh, this Englishman's shirt is actually in the Victorian Albert Museum, and um, as I said, the English kind they they kind of use it. They don't fully use it to the effect as the Italians and, and the Germans are using it. Um, so as you can see around this nick line, it's been pulled into the pleat work and then it's been either, I can't tell, because I was looking at this earlier and you can see the seam here, but I either, so either this here is the seam allowance of the rough or it's just the seam allowance of this band they've put on there. I cannot decide, and I want to look more into this shirt and figure out because it almost I'm almost thinking that they they have done the collar in two pieces with a band holding the pleat Plotting. work together. Yes, I think that that's quite likely. Mm -hmm. um, you would see some of the bunching because you can see. Mm -hmm. You can see through that linen so well. It's so fine. It's just, yeah. You would see the bunching of the gathering stitches. That's what I was thinking also when I was yeah. I was looking at this earlier. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. So yes, I'm glad that oh. I'm not the only one that has come to that conclusion. <laughs> Be aware that that particular uh, shirt has, uh, in different books, been referred to as a boy's shirt or a woman's shirt. Interesting. Because it's rather rather on the small side. Okay. And, um, I've seen it, and you can definitely see that uh, the co you've got the um, collar uh, made out of um, a line, uh, the embroidered piece, and the lining band. Lovely. That's been that's that's awesome. Well, when in the search I found, it said man's shirt, so I, I'm guessing that it might be one of those things that, depending on what time you look at it, probably <laughs> depends on what. Sometimes that happens, but um, again, if we look at the um, if we look at the the cuff here, we've also got that teeny, teeny, tiny pleat work coming in and being gathered up. All right, so that is it for our extant examples. Um, so, like I said, this is more of an overview just to kind of get you if started, and if you're you you're this interests you and you want to research it. Um, so next, I'm going to look at a 
couple pieces that some friends have recreated. So on your left is one of my favorite pictures of, of, um, of uh, Dame Eleanor um, with her lovely um, 14th century uh, smocked, uh, smocked, um, excuse me, apron. So she's got that honeycomb smocking there. And then on the right is, um, is uh, a piece by, is a German, German uh, undershirt by my friend Kisa um, from, uh, from Meridier's, excuse, yeah, Meridier's. Um, and you can see, you can very easily see how she's pleat worked this and this even a simple X embroidery. And, you, and on that, that Italian boy's shirt, we saw that a really simple X embroidery and to, to, um, to kind of stabilize and make sure all the pleats are going to stay in. She's put a band on the back of that um, uh, to, to hold those pleats in place. Um, and it also keeps, um, when I show you the sample piece, and those of you that have made this before, you, you notice a bit of an elasticity. So putting a stabilizer on there, um, you kind of, you take away that elasticity so it, it stays the size you want it to stay. Um, so again, she's done the same on the cuffs with that, that lovely X embroidery. And you can see here how when you embroider, you're, you're picking up every single pleat in order to stabilize it and hold it in place. So. Also, the interior band um, can be replaced. So mm -hmm. when body oils uh, and dust and so forth make it beyond washable, you can very carefully pick that out and mm -hmm. replace it. Yes, yes, very good point. Thank you, thank you, Anne. Uh, actually, it's Ronwin. <laughs> Ronwin, oh, I, it, you come up as Anna here. Hi, Ronwin. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, well, thank you very much. All right, so next, um, so for the sampler that I'm gonna show you, um, and this is, this is a sampler I did um, quite a few years back. Um, I like to start out anymore. I think this start, I don't, I'm not sure what I started out here, but anymore I like to start out with a yard of linen, um, which is gonna be about, and I'd like to do it about four to six inches wide. And you're either gonna want a ruler, I'm gonna, and I'll show you this um, after the, when I, when I can see myself again. Uh, I'm gonna show you, a you're either gonna want a ruler, um, some plastic canvas, um, or you can make, you can take like a three by five ca card or some card stock, um, grid it out with a ruler and then poke holes and that you, it's, it, we're, we're creating a, um, a template to, to, um, to mark our stitching with, with, with this, this second item. Um, you're going to want a fabric marking utensil. <clears throat> For this, I actually prefer a type of fabric marker. It just likes to poke through the holes better, or even a, a, a pencil will also work really good. Um, for needles, I like to use a medium to a long length needle, and then you'll also need an embroidery needle to do your embroidery with, and then you'll need sewing thread or embroidery thread. Okay, so if you would like to further research this, and I, um, I will find somewhere to make this, um, this uh, PowerPoint available to you all. Um, so, oh, I forgot I was gonna bring that. Um, there is a lovely book by Marion McNeely called uh, The German Model Booker. And um, it's got, um, as, as the description says, it's, it's, um, it's a compilation of needle workbooks, so, and she's gone in and not only shown um, uh, the process of, of in, in portraiture matching the, um, the patterns from the book, but she also has a compilation of the actual period patterns they were using at that time, which is, they're really great. They're, they're, I just like looking through it, it's fun. Um, so, and then I've got um, the link to Genevieve von Lublick's blog, blog where you can look at the at her lovely recreation of the Dorothea dress. Um, oh, there is Marion McNeely's uh, website. Um, there is a the, um, 
let's see, Ouija is from Sweden. Um, she does a lot of the, the German reenactment over there. And she's got some, she's just a really great source to have. Um, she's got really lovely research and, um, and you can, help, she kind of helps me go down rabbit holes. Um, my friend Kisa count or my my friend Countess Kisa has a uh, a um, also done a research paper on um, a smocked shirt and apron, um, and she's got if you want to go look at her research paper, it's it's very well done. <clears throat> and she gave me permission to to um, give that to all of you, um, and then if you want to go see. Um, the Luttrell Psalter and look through it. Um, this is the link to the the British Library um, digitized manuscripts where they've got it at. And then if after this you, be, you have any questions or anything, um, you can either find me on Facebook or this is my my email. It's uh, winterbornwhimsy at gmail.com. All right, so that concludes the lecture portions. I want to stop sharing my screen. Hello, I can see all your faces now. All right, so I'm going to get myself over here, move it in front of me, so I can start showing things. So, and I'm going to just mostly do this as a demo. If you want to kind of do yours as I go along, you can, but I've kind of got mine to a point so I can actually demo all of this, the steps and I won't be going through every single stitch with you today. But um, again, here is my, there we go. Here's, here's my old sampler that I have and this is the stretch I was showing you. It stretches, it's really stretchy and springy and kind of fun to play with. Um, when you're just kind of sitting around reading things on the internet. Um, this one, I think has, I think it's a half inch. Yeah, I did a half inch pleat on this. So the pleats are a little bit thick. Um, so I, um, if you were doing that as a ruffle, it would create a nice ruffle. Um, let's see if I can adjust. Come here. There we go. There we go. Okay. Oh, and then I wanted to, oh, here it is. So I did a Swiss dress not too long ago, and I did a pleat work embroidery collar for it. Well, not in pleat work embroidery. I did a, a um, it has a band, but I did all the, you can see, Oh, here we go. You can see the pleats, and this is all the pleats are in here. So this is all one piece. And then I've got the ruffle here, and then here's the band. I have a front band and a back band that I sewed on, um, holding all of that in there. So the original plan was to do the pleat work embroidery, but um, I miscalculated. And um, it, the band ended up being about three inches short <laughs> when I had it to the scrunch that I needed. Um, so, and I know what I did wrong uh, with with my my um, with my sample. So I have not, and if any of you have, feel free to share. I have not found a very good math system for creating um, for figuring out the pleat work size that I need. So what I normally do is kind of, I'll, I'll make a sampler. I'll take a yard of the exact fabric that I'm using and I will pleat work it up. And this one, I just, I pulled it, I didn't pull it um, tight enough when I was, when I, when I did my sampler. Uh, and then, um, and then from there, I'll do a little bit of embroidery on it to kind of say, okay, so you know, if your sampler comes down to like three inches, so I need for every three inches, I need a large yard of fabric. Um, so that's kind of how, that's how I math when I'm doing my smocking. Um, since there's, it de really depends on the thickness of your fabric um, is a big differential about how much you need, um, as well as 
if you're doing a quarter inch pleat or a half inch pleat or even an eighth inch pleat. That's gonna that's gonna help you differentiate or depend on how how much you're gonna sh you're gonna smoosh in there. So that's the end of the show and tell period of this. So I am going to put you down to my hands. Hello. All right. So that oh there. Oh, so one thing I did want to tell you that um before I forget, um, if you're doing whether you're doing a shirt or an apron, or no matter what you're doing, you want to put your hems in first. Um, I know that um, uh, Sarai showed us hers earlier, and she already has her band in, and her pleats are in there, and she's just gonna embroider that. Um, and that's a very good thing to do. You want to make sure your hems are in first. Mostly, it's just, it's just easier. It's, it's just easier that way. And uh, and you'll, you'll you'll thank yourself in the end. Um, so I've got my cloth here. Oh, and I'm going to show you. So there are several ways to mark your cloth. It depends on what you've done, uh, what you want to do. I've used all of these ways. So you can totally just get a ruler and um, decide whether you know in in your course of research whether you want a half inch, a quarter inch. The three eighths inch, you know, how big you, how deep you want your pleat to be. So if you want a half inch pleat, you're going to mark every half inch. If you want a quarter inch pleat, you're going to probably mark, I say that, yeah, yeah, I say that. There's two different ways to do this. So first way, <laughs> if you want a quarter inch pleat on way one, then you're going to mark double what you're going to do. So if I'm doing a quarter inch, I'm going to mark every half inch. Dun, dun, dun. And that's how I've done it here. So way, so, so way one to do this, I'm going to get my thread and my needle. And I like to double, so the thread you're using to hold your pleats, unless it's going to stay there, it doesn't really matter what color it is. I like to use a bright color and I like to use thread that I don't have reserved for another project and usually you know what's left over so I end up with some bright colored thread. Um, if you're doing a real thick fabric you might want to think about getting a quilting thread or I don't know if you would want to go as thick as a buttonhole thread but I double it just for reasons of breakage. So I'm gonna I've got a, quite a long piece here because I want it to be about a yard long. Now when you're, so this is, this thread is going to go, I don't think I've, I'm zoomed out enough, but this thread is going to go the, the entire length of this piece of fabric. I can't get too zoomed out a little bit. So it's going to go, nope, okay. Well, you're just going to have to see it like this. So it's going to go this ent the entire length of fabric. When you're doing something that's three or four or five yards, you're going to probably want to sew it in sections. So you're going to want to put your your thread up a yard and then and then smoosh it down and then take up your thread again and go another yard and then pull it down. That way you're not dealing with five yards of thread because you want one continuous thread when you pull your pleats. So way number one. I'm going to start out here. So I always, instead of tying a knot, because I have double thread, I will just, well, I will, I have my knot holding my threads together. So I will make a loop and I will pull it so that I'm pulling on the thread knot and I'm not really pulling on the fabric. So it's not going to accidentally pop through that fabric like it'll do sometime. So way number one. So this way, this I have, I have it marked at a half inch. That's right. Yes. Let me double check that. Sorry. End of the day, my brain's starting to go to sleep. Okay. Yep. I've got it marked at a half inch and I will get a half inch. I told you wrong earlier. I'm gonna mark it at a half inch. I should get a half inch. 
sized pleat. The other one is the halfway. Yep. So way one, half inch, half inch size pleat. I'm going to go in, 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 after you mark, get all your fabric marked, get your grid marked. I'm going to go in and out. So I'm going to go in one hole and out the other hole. And that's what I've done all along here is I've gone in and out. And this is why I could not find my long needle, but this is why I like a longer needle because I can pick up several of these at a time. So, and there is way one is to do that. And I will go back to that one in just a minute. So, so I'm gonna go all the way to the end with this, but not, Yes. So way two. Actually, I'm going to turn this over and show you it from this side. So way two. So these are marked at a half inch. So what I'm going to get from way two is a quarter inch pleat. So you will get half the amount that you mark it at. Where's my thread? So here we go. So we're going to get our thread. get not as much because I'm not going to go all the way with this one. So again, if I was doing a small piece, I would have the thread the length of the piece. If I was doing a larger piece, I would I would do it, I would have about a yard of thread and sew it. In. Does that make sense when I say that? To sew it in yard sections, but you want a continuous thread. Um, so sometimes, it, depending on, if it's a smaller section, I'll totally just just put up, put um, four needles in and kind of go. Um, so the second way that you're going to get, you're going to, yeah, I'm going to, if I mark it at a half inch, I want to get a quarter inch pleat. It's called, um, I call it the prick method. So instead of going in and out and in and out and in and out, like the last time. Instead, I'm going to prick. I'm going to take for every dot, I'm just going to take a little stitch like that. So I've got little stitches along. So that, and that's going to pull up. Whoop. So this, the, the prick method I have found works really good on thin fabric and the in and out method works a lot better on thicker fabric. This is a thicker linen so that's why I've used the in and out method on this linen but if it was a lighter linen I would use the prick method and that means when you pull your pleats all your stitching is going to be on one side unlike the in and out method where all your stitching is going to be in the middle of your pleat. So, so does anyone have questions on the two methods? Do those make sense? I see some nods. Okay. All right. So I am going to go back to the other side and finish what I started. This is my last row. I went and did the other rows earlier so that I can kind of show you pulling in the pleats. So we're just gonna go in and out and in and out. And I do have a seam in the middle of this fabric and I mostly wanted to put that in there, A, because I had two pieces of scrap fabric I wanted to use. And I also wanted to show you that you can, you just kind of, got to ignore the seams. It's really nice if you can get the seam to be on the 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 um the inside of the pleat, but if that doesn't happen, it's okay. No one's going to notice unless you sew the seam ends down with red thread like I did. So, but I when I especially when I do pleat work embroidery, I like to to sew them flat. Usually I I would do this in um by hand in a um, 
in a in a white linen that matches this but since it was a demo i thought i would do it in red just to kind of show so um i was told second hand um that a lady that taught this at Penzik one year said um, something to the effect of you don't really need to mark your fabric because you will end up kind of having the the natural length of how you know you'll you'll your brain will want to do to to all do, kind of come in and want to do all the same length um, i think that's a really neat idea and it saves time without marking fabric however i like to mark my fabric because then i know um that i'm that i'm doing it the same and you know you can tell you know if your marks get a little off that's okay you can you can adjust your stitching to um to even Let's see on this one i got a little off um, okay Hang on. i did get off oh i know where i did i'm totally missed one but that's okay in and out in out and in and out I did that twice. Wow. Okay, there we go. I know what I did. I got my marks off. That's what I did. I need to look at this. So let's match it there. I'll match it there. And I'll match it there. Okay, there we go. Okay, so now i have all of my pleats in and at this time i would actually give my fabric a really nice press to make it all happy and make my stitches all relax and then so we're going to go to the end here and i'm just gonna i left some tails some tails aren't very long and some tails are so but i'm just going to kind of gather them best as I can in my hand, all together, all together. All right, so then we're just going to start pushing our fabric. And this is why you want to make sure you've got good knots on the end. Really gonna put some pressure on that. Oh. So there we go. So I went down from a yard to about not quite, well, I say that about four inches there. So if I was doing this, I would say that for every four inches, I would need a yard. So the next thing I'm going to do, this is kind of the fiddly part. Is to kind of pull everything, make sure you want to just kind of make sure all your pleats are going to sit in there right. You can tell I messed that little pleat up right there, but that's okay. It will be fine. It'll work. Okay. I'm going to trim these. I've kind of tried it a couple different ways. Um, one time I actually took some cardboard pieces and I put a cardboard piece at each end to see if that would stabilize them a little better. So now I'm just going to kind of pull my pleat as tight as I can. Come here. And I'm gonna 
make a little stitch. And I'm going to knot that. Well, yeah, gonna knot that in there. So there's one. So now I'm going to go through and I want to do that for every fabric or every piece to make sure that it's nice, that my pleats are nice and secure and that they're going to lay nicely and in there. And this is the mistake that I made when doing the sampler for my German shirt. I did not pull them tight enough. So when I measured, my measurements were off. So you want to make sure that you pull your pleats tight enough to, so that your, your math is correct for figuring out how much fabric you're going to need to pull into your pleats to get the results that you want. Because it's, you know, especially if you have a really long piece, it is not very fun to put all the pleats in and then have to go take them out and redo your and redo your piece because it's time consuming. And sometimes you don't have time for that. But it but the however it is a learning experience. So if I had used the prick method on this, then all of my all of my threads, you could kind of see them along the top. And I I like using the prick method because I can use my threads as grid lines for when I am embroider or when I sew. Um, you can kind of tell where these are kind of but not not as easily as if i had the stitching laying on top and you can see as i'm pulling these i'm kind of going in and making sure my pleats are going to sit correctly in there so that they're nice and easy to get to when I start my embroidery. Okay. Last one is the end that if this was not my sampler and an actual piece, I would have already had that that end hemmed. Okay, so as you can see, I have a lot of fabric waste, or not fabric, a lot of thread waste here. So this is why you don't want to use your good thread when when putting in these pleats. You want to use an older, not an old thread, but you know, you, you want to use something not very expensive just because you are going to waste a lot of it. 
but as you can see now, I've got my pleats all in there. They're all mostly even. If they're not even, that's okay. If they're a little, little uneven in spots, that's okay. Some of that will be pulled out when you do the embroidery. But the important thing is you see the top parts because those are going to even out when you embroider and then you you take out your your stabilizing threads. Um, so and this looks like um, the 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 juror the the juror um, portraiture of how he's got those nice long pleats and then he has that that piece at the top. So um, so if you wanted to do something like that, you know, all you'd have to do is put your your nice beautiful band at the top and you're done. Or even um, the that Italian. Um, Camicia was was very similar to this. And you see that you have this nice ruffling here that if this was part of a sleeve, it would come up and, and poof out very nicely. Um, I always like to do a little more than I am going to, um, to embroider. Um, go, you wanna go down about an inch or two more, just, it just, it makes things a bit easier to hold in. Um, so I'm going to show you where the, oh, there you are. So I'm going to show you just a couple easy stitches to get you started. So I am going to knot this. If it's a garment, I will usually knot it and then secure it on the back. So you can, you come into one of these pleats, you can do your initial stitch on the inside of one of these pleats where it's not going to be seen, just to secure it. I want it to. I always like to make myself some guidelines. <laughs> Straight lines are really nice to have sometimes. So I'm just going to use this pencil. I'm going to create some little half inch guidelines so that my stitching is a little straight for you today. Okay. So, um, come here. so when I start, I'm going to come out on my line through the back to the front to start. And if I'm just doing a simple line, it's, it's very much like a stem stitch um, or a back stitch. So I'm going to catch catch this piece and I'm going to make a stitch and I'm going to go back so so this is like a back stitch or a stem stitch and I'm going to catch my next little pleat and I'm going to go back and I'm going to catch the next one and the next one till I have a line of stitching. All across there. Oh, come here. You want to get up there. There you go. So, and I'm just, I'm not going down in for this one. I'm just catching the top of that pleat. Um, depending on what you're doing, um, there are a couple, this, this, I'm just going to show you the basic stitches today. Um, the, the Mary of, excuse me, the Habsburg gown, um, I, there's a, I cannot remember, and I should have looked it up before today, um, 
there's a term for the type of stitching it is. I kind of call it tunnel stitching because what they're actually doing is creating a pattern by going over several and then they're going in under several. So they're actually going through underneath the pleat and then coming out to create that pattern. And there is a term for that and I apologize for not, for forgetting to look that up. Um, but it is, I have not, I have attempted that once and I have not quite accomplished it yet. <laughs> so um, it's a bit, bit difficult just to figure out how far down into the pleat you want to go. But I'll get it. I'll try it. Maybe this will inspire me to try that again sometime soon. All right, so now that I am at the end, just to make sure I'm going to go, and I want to go down in to the underside of the pleat. And I'm going to kind of like I started, I'm going to secure it to the side wall of that pleat. You could also secure it to the back hump. I just like to go to the side wall because it, it's, it just looks nicer that way in my, in my opinion. Um, so the next thing I want to show you is the honey, how to do the honeycomb stitch. And these are kind of the two, you, doing a back stitch and, you know, if you were doing, I'll, I'll do a V also and show you how to do an X. Um, so, uh, but next we'll do the honeycomb stitch. So again, I'm going to start, where's my line? There it is. I'm going to start on the back and make my first stitch to secure. And then I'm going to come up. Come here. Like last time, I'm going to come up from the underside, coming up through the underside into my pleat. And then I'm, I'm going to catch my pleat and I'm going to come back. So I'm going to make one stitch. And then I'm going to make another stitch on the same the same way. So I've got one one stitch between two pleats. Come here. I'm going to do two stitches on the same pleat. So if you can see that, that's I've got two pleats stick, stitched together. So then I'm going to go down in to that second pleat, and I'm going to come out the back side. So if I can find where my needle is going to come out. My pleat over. So there we go. So I'm going to come out the back side of this pleat. Okay. And then I have to see where I'm going. I'm going here. Here, here, here. Okay. So then, so I have, so here's pleat one and pleat two. The, and so I'm going to go down about a quarter inch on my, the, the, the pleat that I, I went in or I went into the back. And now I'm going to come out the front a quarter inch down. So it's got this, so it's going to hold, see how, how like every other pleat is held together and it makes that, so that's what we're doing. So we're just going to work on, I'm just going to work on two at a time, almost doing a little V up and down, and then we'll do the next row. So, and this is, again, this is the honeycomb. So I'm going to, yes. Could you put up the sample again and show us the back? Oh, yes. yes, let me get into to one. Okay, yep. So, okay. So, okay, so here's, let me find a better one. This one, okay. So here's a row. So you mm -hmm. see, so here's, so this, if we're looking at this one right here. Okay. So it's, I'm gonna come out the back with my needle. My needle is going to come out here, and then I'm going to go back 
into the front and that's going to take oh, there it is and that's going to take me let me mark this so oh wait i have a colorful pin man i think i got this so where this red pin is oh let me get my finger out of the way so where this red pin is was where we started mm -hmm. And then I went went down into that pleat and I came up where the yellow pin is. I think. Yes. Oh, uh, okay. That makes sense. So here's here's the back. So here's where the so this top is where the red pin is, and mm -hmm. this bottom is where the yellow pin is. Does that okay. make sense? Okay. Yes, it does. Yay for video learning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't just hand it to you and be like, here. <laughs> Yeah. But does that make sense? So does that make sense now? How we're doing yes. that? Okay. Yes. And then you kind of, like I said, you, you, when you do the honeycomb, you kind of work, you work two rows at a time. So I'm going to go, going to do, so I'm going to go this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go to my second row and do the same thing. So you're making little V's and, yeah. and, You'll eventually get where you can actually work from the front of the fabric and figure out where you're you're going. Um, so yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, I I think Beth. Oh, I've got some things on the chat. I'm gonna look at the chat real quick while while we're paused. Oh yes, yes. The hemmed is is the shirt. Thank you, Beth. And um, and uh, Kelly says, it takes me hours to do that much still. <laughs> yeah. And then Beth says, I bought a commercial pleater years ago. The pleats are really tiny, better for fine linen. I need to find new needles for it. Yes. Um, Kisa doesn't have it anymore, but she showed me one that she did with a pleater. And it does do very fine, like, I want to say eighth inch pleats. Um, so again, that's if that's what you're wanting, then go for it. Um, cause it, it works and it saves you time <laughs> and sometimes you just need to save a little time. All right. So, um, I'm going to do a couple more stitches on the honeycomb just to show you. So again, we're coming in, we come down where that yellow pin was. Yeah. yeah great. Abby, just so you know, I pinned the video on you because you're showing people an example and that way it won't go back and forth between you and whoever else might be talking to you. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. You know when you want that taken off or something. I can. Do okay. It. That's it's, it's fine. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly fine for now. Um, I actually have mine on. I can just see all of you. Because it makes me not stare at myself <laughs> and go, ooh, I'm doing what? Um, but actually, I'm going to turn it. Oh, come here. Okay, there we go. So, so now I'm going to do the second stitch, and I'm just dealing with those two pleats. And I'm going to pull one and back in and two. And then I'm going to go, oh, that's a little big. I'm going to go down in to that second pleat. Actually, this might be easy to show you from the top. If I go in, I'm going to go in that second pleat and then up here back to the top right beside that first stitch. I think that that is an easier way to show you all other than going to the back. And then I'm going to take another couple stitches. Then again, I'm going to go down into that second pleat and and through the back and to that second row. And down through. And then I'm going to take another couple of stitches. So and then you just go, you just do that. You go up and down and up and down and you will eventually get one row done and then you'll do your second row 
and then maybe you'll do a third row and then you'll end up with that really nice honeycomb effect. So, um, and then in the next thing, the last thing I'll show you is how to do X's. And these are actually, um, you can, these are actually V's. So it's two V's together instead of going, you could go all the way down, but I have found it's easier and a little more secure if you go down halfway and then up. So, and that's just a matter of, get my thread here. That's just a matter of judgment. Um, like I said, I would mark on yours kind of, you know, I'm gonna, it's gonna take me like four, five to go, well, maybe not five, maybe six, six to do one diagonal. So, um, and I want my diagonal to meet here. So again, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna do my securing stitch. Whoop, come here. And then come out. Come here. To the front. And then so I can see myself. Here we go, this way. <laughs> oh, I know. You know what? If I put it back on my hands, it's a lot easier. <laughs> So, and then instead of going straight across, let's see, what did I say? I said six stitches, so, hang on, let me think about this, back stitch. Yes, okay. So, I'm gonna catch one pleat, I'm gonna go down and catch the next pleat. Two, one, two, three. Four, five, six, and then I'm going to go back up. So two, three, four, five. Six. There we go. And then down. Two. Oop, this is where my seam is. It's a little bulky. Three. Four. Five. Come here. Six. And one more time, I think I can go up again. Two, three, four, five, oh, come here, five, six. So it's just like the back stitch we did at the beginning, but we are going up and down. So we're going up and down. So once I have my first set of V's done, I will again secure it on the back. And then, So, so with six stitches, I need to meet here. So we're gonna come up. And let's see, we've got, I'm gonna prick one, two, Three, four, oh, not gonna quite make it. Five, six, and then 
gonna go down two three and i'm also as i do this i'm also watching to make sure that they're kind of matching in distance and that my center ones are lining up again this one's a little bulky because that's where my seam is but that's okay Oh, come here. Uh, hope this one met up a little bit better. Four. Okay. So now I have some little axles. Do, 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 do. Yay. All right. So those are the three stitches that I was going to show you this evening. And that's the sampler I was going to show you. So I am done. Unless any of you guys have any questions or anything. Have you uh, made an apron? I have. Um, I gave it away. <laughs> it was the first thing I made. So I'm actually getting ready to make another. Hey, I think after, this is kind of re re um got my energy to make another apron so I can do some fun some fun So what is what is some advice you'd have about an apron? Um again, make sure you do all your hems first. Um uh kind of like what I learned with my collar, always double check how um double check your uh, how much fabric you need. Um, and uh, one thing I did with mine, so when you put your, um, so, um, um, excuse me, Sarah, um, Sarai, I knew, I'm like, Sari, that's not right. Sarai. I just took mine apart. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Sarai put her band in first. So did, did you find that putting your band in first didn't really work out very well? Um, I'm probably not going to do that next time around. Mm -hmm. So I also realized I made my pleats way larger than ah. what I wanted visually with my finished product to be and for how light my linen is. Because this is, I think, this is, I think, fabric, the, yeah, fabric store midweight. Okay. Yeah, you'll probably want to do, you might want to do a quarter inch pleat on yeah. that one. Yeah, and so you can yeah. see how, here, let me see. I don't know if you can see it, but you can see oh, straight yeah. up pencil marks, like, and how far apart they are. Mm -hmm. Are yeah, those, are, just, yeah. Just way too big. Or if that's a half inch pencil mark, you can use the prick method and you won't have to redraw your your um your uh what is that? your your wow I'll, my book yep i'll just redraw it okay <laughs> but um um when you when you both put, of you um about how wide um uh, did you pick your uh, fabric for the aprons um is the width of the fabric so yard plus yeah, if so I was inches wide. Yeah, let's see. I did mine with a heavy weight. This is a heavy weight. So where's my? I've got a measure from a different spot. So if I was doing an apron, I would want it from here to here. So actually, I I could go here. So on this. So this ended up being, when I got it all ruched up, it ended up being about two and a half inches. However, you want to make sh wait until you release your fabric to, to measure it because you see this has a little bit of space in between all of the pleats, depending on how your tension is. So if these are about this, yeah, actually this is the same fabric. 
So if this is the tension I was showing at, I would, this one is, this one ended up three in, come here, hang on, let me lay this down. This one ended up at three inches. So let's say that this started out as a yard. So if I was making an apron that was gonna end at 18, I would take 18 times three, is that it? For every three inches, I need a yard. So I need one, two, three, four, five, six yards in length. And you can do a, and this, this is a half inch pleat. So you, you could do a quarter inch pleat with three yards of fabric for an 18 inch wide apron. Does that make sense? Yeah, Thank you. I feel like that's, I feel like that's still like a lot of fabric to use on. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and let me, let me pull up the, oh, I'll come back to the chat in a minute. Let me pull up the women in the, the Psalter again. I want to see. So, how Roman, wide? I think you were asking about what type of fabric I had. Went down to the bottom of my fabric. There's a red line on it, which means I bought it from Dharma Trading um, because I haven't had that part yet. Uh, which means that it is probably the four and a half ounce from Dharma, and it's 54 inches wide before you wash it. So I think it's closer to 50 after you wash it. So these ladies have actually, their aprons are not that, I mean, there's not a straight on, but they, they aren't gonna be that much big. So, or that, so we're looking at their apron being about, I think I was putting it too wide. So your apron's probably gonna be no more than a foot at the top and that would be if you get that was three inches say that was three inches per yard one so that would be you could get away with three to four yards for a, an apron that's going to be 11 to 12 inches skinny oh and beth is oh let me go back to the chat there we go um Oh, come here. Where's my chat? Oh, oh, come here. I can read it to you if you like. Yeah, it's, I can't get it to, to go. It's not doing what I want it to do. She says she did hers on the pleater, so her pleats are only around an eighth of an inch. Mm -hmm. um, they don't tend to go around the hips like modern apes do. Yeah, yeah. But that is very, very kind of good point. Or something too, like it sort of reminds me like you'll see some Norse stuff that's done like a hanger rock, which is really mm -hmm. a nice panel to be decorative. And mm -hmm. wouldn't really, my opinion is they wouldn't really have been used as an apron. Are these something similar? Like you're not gonna want to get grease and stuff on these because they would be hard to clean with all those pleats, right? That would make that, it more that is a, to wash. That is, mm -hmm. that is a good point. Yeah, that is a good point. However, the ladies in the Luttrell Psalter are doing laborious work. So I'm thinking that they probably either dealt with, like if they spilt something into the pleats, they probably just dealt with it, or they had probably a, their own personal way of maybe getting in there and, and, and cleaning them out. Um, well, but I think like of illuminations and stuff you see I as the illuminator take a lot of license and how I'm doing it mm. like it's an armor that doesn't even exist they're doing stuff like of Jesus and in his time and they're using plate armor 
that's many centuries later because that's what people would recognize even though it's not accurate. So they're using a lot of license with what they're doing. Do we think that could be part of it too? No, yeah, that is a very good point. Yeah, it could be that they saw one person probably at market wearing, I didn't think of that, yeah. One, like they could have seen one person at market wearing an apron, which would have been, you know, market day, you want to show off that, uh, that you have a little, you know, this is my nice apron that I spent some more money on. So they pro may have seen a smocked apron at something like that and just assume that this is what people wear. That's a very good point. Thanks for bringing that up. No problem, no problem. Mm -hmm. I actually was paying attention. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to make a pleated apron? <laughs> Probably not. That's a little late period for me. I, I wouldn't mind doing it like um, when I did more 14th century, I did cuffs and stuff that were like that. So I understand the, the thing and that there's a lot more elasticity to it than you. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. Some really Gracie? nice stuff. Greasy. Yeah. Definitely some evidence for smocking in the Norse periods. In as the Kostrup gal. Well, I'm not saying that there's not. I'm just saying that for me, like one of the big reasons that I do like or it's very comfortable. You give me all kinds of crap for wearing wool at Penzik all summer, but it's not that bad if you get the right weight and stuff. It's really not as hot as people say. <laughs> but I like the simple patterns, you know, like how I like the gussets and I like it just fits me as far as comfortable. It's very well. I like that, but you're right. You're right. <laughs> okay. She's at, I'm not at a good way to see this, but you've got another comment. It says when you okay. smock your shirt, do you cut it out in the pattern first or do you smock it first? Um, when I did, Oh, on the floor. When I did my shirt, I cut it out, and I actually, because I was not, sh I, this was, I was not sure of, because of the way I made this, um, I wasn't sure where my arm gusset was going to go, so I actually finished the top of the shirt, and then I did my pleating, and then I finished the rest of the shirt. Um, so, you're gonna want the part that you're going to pleat you want to get that as finished as you can before you pleat it um because it's because this is my little ruffle with my little bitty rolled hem in it and that would have really not been pleasant to do if i would have pleated it and then put the hem in so you're going to want to get it at least the part you're pleating done before, um, before, yeah, let we'll see, yeah. That. That's really helpful because I made a, a basic, super basic shirt and it ended up being like way too big. Like, mm -hmm. I wish I should know the measurements of my fingers, but like two finger lengths on both sides of the shoulders need to be taken in. Oh, mm -hmm. so I'm deciding whether or not I want to smock the opening for the neck mm -hmm. or just take it in on the sides. Yeah. Because I know that in, I do Italian and so it, that kind of ruffled pleating looks good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if it was salvageable, like I could try the pleating on it or if it's just something like, yeah, just take you, it in, put a collar on. Yeah, you could totally, I would, I would hem the collar. And you may have to play, depending on how much is in there, you may have to play around with where the pleats are going to like put it, you know, use long, long strings enough to go around and play with where, how wide you want your pleats to sit. Um, and then probably secure those on the back. Or let me go back to, let me go back to, um, the Habsburg gown, because I'm pretty sure this is um, restoration and, and saving, but this will help me explain another way you can do it. If you didn't want to, come on, if you didn't want to hem it first, 
see how this restoration band is 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 put in here um again i'm pretty sure this it just the way it, it looks i'm pretty sure that this is a restoration band and not an actual part of the original garment to hold the pleats in there but what you could do is you could put the pleats in without hemming it and then do kind of like you would do a bias tape so you would sew the band on like this was so that your um seam allowance is on the inside and then you can and then turn that oh, and then turn that band under and you can kind of also use that to secure the you know depending on how big you make that band you can use it to secure but you almost do it like a like you would use a bias tape or a facing to um to uh, do the hem does that make sense it does it's actually very helpful yeah i like being helpful